Welcome to lecture 24 of biology 116 entitled circulation. What we're going to be looking at now in our look through the systems of the human body is the idea of the circulatory system. And in order to get a good understanding of where we are and what we're going to be looking at, we're going to begin by looking at this and creating a background flow chart just to get a good understanding of what circulation really means. So, what we're first going to get out of the way are those animals that do not have circulation or a circulatory system specifically. So let's look very briefly at animals without any sort of circulatory system. CS for circulatory system. These types of animals will include things like a flatworm, which just has a very basic flat body so there's no need for an extensive circulatory system. Also, this will include things like cnidarians, which are very, very simple animals. These are going to have a gastrovascular cavity. Again, no need for a circulatory system in these simple animals. And also, uh, animals like nematodes. All of the nematodes will be pseudocoelomates, and they're going to be having this fluid-like system that is separate from a circulatory system. So these are just examples of animals without a circulatory system. These are less complex animals, but there are going to be more complex animals that do have a circulatory system. And in order to understand what a circulatory system is and what it really entails, we have to understand three basic components associated with it. So let's begin by understanding the basics of any old circulatory system. Generally speaking, the circulatory systems that we focus on are going to have uh, all the time there will be three basic components. So let's take a look at what they are. We need to have all three in order to have and classify as a complete circulatory system. The three basic components are as follows. A circulatory system must have some sort of circulatory fluid. So this will be CIRC for circulatory some sort of circulatory fluid. There must also be a vessel network of some sort. We'll get more uh, on this idea a little bit later. Vessels are just places where circulatory fluid can flow through. For right now, that's all we need to know. And also, a circulatory system must include a heart. A heart is just going to be classified for right now, generally speaking, as a muscular pump. Now, we've all heard of a heart before, but we're going to get into the details as we move forward in this lecture. It's a muscular pump specifically that pushes the circulatory fluid. So it's a muscular pump pushing fluid, and that circulatory fluid has to push through this vessel network. So we'll write that down. Pushing fluid through the vessel network. So we basically combine the first two components into one major component known as the heart that sort of drives both of these simultaneously. So those are our three basic components of circulatory systems. What we can sort of now focus on, now that we understand what a circulatory system must have, which are these three things, let's look at the different types of circulatory system. And generally speaking, there are going to be two types of CS, circulatory systems. And those are summarized on figure 42.3. Both of these are going to contain in some way, shape, or form a circulatory fluid, a vessel network, and also some sort of central heart that drives both of these together. So let's take a look. The two types of circulatory systems are as follows. The first one that we'll look at is an open circulatory system, and the other is called a closed circulatory system. We'll get to that in just a second. An open circulatory system is usually found in animals uh, in organisms like arthropods, which are like insects, and mollusks. And the exception to the mollusks, if you remember from animal diversity, are cephalopods. So cephalopods do not have an open circulatory system. They have a closed. But all mollusks, except for cephalopods and all arthropods, like insects, will contain an open circulatory system. So let's see how they classify their circulatory fluid, vessel network, and heart. How do they achieve those components? In an open circulatory system, the fluid will be called hemolymph. This is the circulatory fluid, and thus that stipulation, that requirement for a circulatory system has been met. So we have circulatory fluid called hemolymph, and in an open circulatory system, hemolymph is also simply going to be known as, aka, ISF. This stands for interstitial fluid that will be bathing the tissues. The correct term here is bathing the tissues. So we have this fluid that's sort of all around the tissues, it's going to be circulating throughout the open circulatory system of this organism. It's called hemolymph. It's also called interstitial fluid. Now, the open circulatory system will also possess a central heart organ. 
The heart in this situation will do two basic things, and this is what all hearts do. The heart undergoes contractions and relaxations. So we'll write contractions here. These will be important. And also the heart undergoes relaxations, both of which are going to drive the circulatory fluid through the vessel network. So let's take a look at the distinction between them. When the heart undergoes contractions, this is when hemolymph is pumped through the circulatory vessels. So we'll write that down. Hemolymph, which is the circulatory fluid, will be pumped. That's the correct term here. That's the one that we want to use in circulatory language. Hemolymph pumped through the various circulatory vessels that are within this organism. Because it's in the circulatory system, it will possess circulatory vessels. And then the pumping process is all going to be uh, to send this hemolymph to an area. The reason why we're pumping it is to push it somewhere, to get it to the right spot. And the spot that we're trying to get it to are known as interconnected sinuses. So we want to take hemolymph and pump it throughout the circulatory vessels so that it reaches interconnected sinuses interconnected sinuses in an open circulatory system, think of this area as just the space that surrounds an organ. The regular old extracellular space are known as interconnected sinuses. Those organs need this circulatory fluid. We'll talk about why that need is in a little bit later and in a future flowchart. But for right now, just know that a contraction results in pumping, and that pumping sends circulatory fluid, hemolymph, through circulatory vessels to interconnected sinuses. In addition, a heart undergoes relaxations. And in the relaxation state, this is when we're going to have that circulatory fluid, that hemolymph in an open circulatory system. It's actually going to just be sucked back. It's sucked back into the heart via pores. So it goes back to the heart during relaxation via these pores that are within this open circulatory system. In addition, an open circulatory system will generally be classified as one that is very much low pressure. Now, the low pressure here is going to be important when we look at the idea and role of pressure within circulation. But for right now, low pressure is going to be defined as the following. In an open circulatory system, when you have low pressure, this forces the circulatory fluid known as hemolymph it forces that hemolymph throughout the body and spreads it out throughout the body and it's also going to be relatively nicely spread out. Now, the majority of the body, the body wants the hemolymph in an open circulatory system. An arthropod needs to make sure that hemolymph reaches the specific organs that it needs to get to. Now, the one thing is the low pressure system, as nice as it sounds here, there are some advantages and disadvantages to this idea. The major disadvantage with the low pressure system associated with a circulatory system would be that it's very much inefficient. And the inefficiency is always in relation to something else. As compared to what we'll look at next, the closed circulatory system, it's very much inefficient. But you may be wondering, why would it be done then? Well, these are lesser order organisms. These aren't advanced organisms, arthropods. Think insects. There's going to be an advantage, though, due to the sort of trade-off that we have here between inefficiency and the advantage. The other trade-off would be that a low-pressure system is just simply less costly. It takes less... Uh, metabolic energy to push the hemolymph throughout the body and to relax and contract the heart, etc. Overall, it's just less costly way to make sure that a circulation of some sort of fluid happens throughout a vessel network via the use of a heart. So we have this uh, trade-off between inefficiency and costliness that is seen in an open circulatory system. Finally, the last thing in this video that we'll look at is a closed circulatory system. A closed circulatory system will involve all three components, just like an open circulatory system, but in just a little bit of a different form. Closed circulatory systems are usually found in things like annelids, cephalopods, and vertebrates, so higher order organisms. What we want to focus on in a closed circulatory system are two major things. The first thing is blood. Blood will serve as the circulatory fluid now. Before it was hemolymph, hemolymph was also known as ISF, that is not the case in a closed circulatory system. A closed circulatory system will have blood, and it actually will have ISF, but those are two completely separate things. Here, it's just one and the same. Here, in a closed circulatory system, blood is the exclusive form of the circulatory fluid. It will be found within and moving within vessels, so we have that vessel network that's definitely going to be satisfied. And again, I want to reiterate that this is very much different than ISF. It is not the same thing as interstitial fluid like hemolymph is. 
And in addition, another very important part of a closed circulatory system is this central heart organ. Heart, again, is a muscular pump. But here, what we're going to be doing is the following. In the heart, we're going to have uh, overall blood being pumped in this situation, no longer hemolymph, but this heart will pump blood into large vessels. And we're talking larger vessels now because we're talking larger, more advanced organisms. And now these large vessels will then eventually have to branch into smaller vessels. So they branch into smaller vessels. And then when they branch into smaller vessels, this eventually allows blood to get to organs because organs need blood. Blood is carrying oxygen, it's carrying nutrients, it's carrying stuff that the organs want and absolutely need. And in order to do that, we originally start as a large vessel, large vessel that branches into a smaller vessel and then eventually gets to the organ. But the thing that drives this process of getting from a large to a small to an organ, that's going to be the heart that's driving all of this. Overall, when we see a closed circulatory system, we have one major advantage. And the advantage here is that there is a higher blood pressure in this closed circulatory system. Now, why is that an advantage specifically? A higher, blood uh, a higher blood pressure in this type of system is going to be associated with an overall more efficient system. Yes, it costs more energy, metabolic energy, to do this, but this is a larger organism capable of meeting that metabolic uh, necessity or need for the efficiency. And it's a good trade-off here. And in addition, overall, because it's a bit higher blood pressure and more efficient system, this is where we usually see this type of system in bigger and larger and more active animals. And therefore, because of their uh, large size and because of their increased activity, they need a more efficient system to push blood circulatory fluid throughout their vessel network via the heart. And that's why they utilize a closed circulatory system. So that covers our introductory background look at circulation. We'll continue our discussion on circulation and specifically look in more detail at this idea of blood movement in the next video.